Well, good morning and happy Easter. Watching online, you're here in the sanctuary. Welcome to our service at Northwest Bear United Church on a lovely Easter Sunday morning. After the time, please join for a time of fellowship and a festival of chocolate in West Hennial Hall. We're going to begin the service with our gathering song. It's number 409, and Voices United are on the screen. Morning is broken. We'll sing the first two verses. We'll have a very short greeting, and then we'll sing verse 3. take a moment and greet your neighbors but briefly Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Easter. I, too, want to welcome you and welcome everybody who's watching from home or wherever you're watching from. We're so glad to have you with us. For a few moments when I wake up, I thought maybe we had Easter Sunday and April Fool's Day mixed up with the snow. 
but it's still a beautiful morning. The sun's out, and we're so glad to have you with us for this special service. As always, we like to ask, uh, begin by seeing if anybody's. Uh, would like to introduce themselves if they're new today or if you're celebrating. We'd love to know what you're celebrating. We're going to keep it as brief and move it as long as quickly as we can. But is there anybody having a special day today that you would like to share with the congregation? Today's Lori's birthday. birthday. Simon. Here for the first time. Happy to have you here. Welcome. <laughs> David. Uh, Ken's mother is here from Bob Cajun. She was supposed to come here after lunch, but she tripped up and came here for the Nice to have you, Ruth. Welcome. <laughs> well, if you are celebrating today, we hope you have a great day other than Easter, and I hope you enjoy your Easter celebrations as well. I know there's a couple of announcements. I'm going to ask those who have them to please come forward. Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. Just a short uh, announcement because Reverend Phil told me to make it short and sweet. 27th of April is a progressive euchre. I'll be selling tickets in West Down Ale Hall amongst the chocolates. $10 for the tickets. I'll be there with the yellow tie and white shirt on. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Sharon, and I am the youth group coordinator. Just a friendly reminder that we're selling chocolate after church. So if you haven't got your Easter chocolate for your family and friends, you can get it today, right back there, for just $3 and $5. And another announcement about the Northwest clothing. It's ready to be picked up uh, back there as well. So just come see me and I'll get you all kitted out. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. My name is Deb White, and I'm here today to remind you of the five-part speaker series, uh, Health, Happiness, Harmony, which is coming up very soon. Um, we invite you to join us on Wednesday evenings from 7 to 8.30, starting April 10th. And we're really excited about the speakers that have agreed to join us for that uh, time. So we hope that you'll come out. Uh, perhaps you'd like to come for one or two. Perhaps you'll come for all of them. And why not bring a friend? Uh, there is no charge, but we will gladly accept a free will donation and refreshments and a time of fellowship will happen afterwards. So if you need any more information or would like to know more about the speakers, you can find that in the Northwest News. Thank you. Well, good morning and happy Easter. Once again, your outreach committee is giving you a twofer. Two announcements for the price of one. First, we want to know if any of you would like to become a loafer. No, I'm not talking about those shoes we used to call loafers. I'm talking about becoming one of those people who makes a loaf of, or two of sandwiches for the Busby Center. Our goal is 30 loaves for April 7th, so give it a try. Add your name to the sheet, it's out there in West End Hall, and become a lovely loafer. If you're a guy, you can call yourself a lively loafer. Next, you remember that Outreach Committee operates the wishing well out there in the lobby. It's where we leave items for local charities. And you remember that we pretend that the wishing well can talk, but only to Catherine DeLonardo, our church administrator, and to me, because I have been appointed a official well-wisher. As such, I have the following jobs. Number one, I wish you well for the day, the week, the month. Number two, I continue the wishing well's instructions to educate you about aphorisms. They are short, pointed sentences that express a wise, clever observation or a general thought. And today's aphorism is, there are no new sins. The old ones just get more publicity. And the Wishing Well thanks you for your generosity in March in helping the Women's and Children's Shelter. In the words of one of our members, you've done good. And now, the moment you've been waiting for. Drum roll. OK, stop. In April, the Wishing Well will be helping loads of love. That's a program run by Barry Families Unite. Can you believe that for some low-income families in Barrie, they often have to choose between food and clean clothes? Doing laundry at a laundromat can be beyond their means, and so 
Loads of Love uses social media and emails to appropriate agencies to let those folks know that they can go to a specific laundromat in town to do their laundry for free. Very Families Unite people are there with rolls of coins, lots of laundry soap, etc., to allow people in need to do their laundry. So we can help in April by giving these things, stain remover, dryer sheets, bottled water, drinks and non-perishable snacks, quarters and loonies, if you put them maybe in a Ziploc uh, and drop them off. And remember, when you leave something in the wishing well, it says thank you. And so now, until we meet again, I wish you well. Thanks, Alf. And if you really you think he's joking about the wishing well saying thank you, it's not. You've got to try it out. It's very, very cool. Just a couple more announcements. First of all, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Luena. Where's Luena? Luena for getting all our, our flowers today and decorating the church. It looks beautiful. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say thanks to Barb. If you saw the display out there for spring in the lobby, she did that. Thank you, Barb, for putting that together. Quick note that we do have a new members uh, Sunday. That's coming up April 28th. If you'd like to join the church officially, we'd love to have you. There's a breakfast preceding the service and then the new member service. So please talk to me if you'd like to join the church. Um, and I missed a birthday this morning. Where's Desiree? Right there in the back. Desiree told me last night at youth group that she is having turning 13 next week. So Desiree, stand up for a second. <laughs> Happy birthday. And finally, by, way back in the beginning of Lent, we gave you a Lenten challenge and invited you to take something old and turn it into something new. And a couple of people, at least a couple of people, maybe there's more and I'll ask, uh, took up that challenge. So I'd like to show a couple of quick slides. The first is uh, Sharon Kitt Cemetery, who took uh, old window frames, turned them into a mirror, and gave them to her nieces and nephews. So uh, Sharon, it's beautiful. Thank you. The second one, this is Linda Van Russell. Linda's sitting at the back there, and looks like rolling pins and... Plates turned into bird feeders, so that's really cool. Oh, that was Murray, okay. Murray, congrats, that's beautiful. But I'm sure you were the inspiration, Linda. <laughs> Deb, what did you do? So made a bath mat out of old t-shirts, amazing. Anybody else do anything? Laura. Wow, very cool. Thanks, uh, Laura. George. Um, this is an old lamp, and our collection of shelves uh, changed it from an old lamp to a, like a speech that lamp. So, <laughs> so use your shelves and made, turn them into a lamp. That's amazing. Anybody else? Well, if you did make something, you didn't bring it today, bring it back again. We'd love to see it. Let's begin our service now with our call to worship. The pattern of death and resurrection is the pattern for all our creating and all our loving. Out of chaos comes new creation. Out of stillness comes the dancing. And out of the death of the old comes the birth of the new. Easter is here. Let our hallelujahs ring through this church and beyond. Our opening hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today, let us stand and sing together.
share with you it's called the East of Blessing written by the Irish uh, poet and writer John Donahue. Um, I'll do the first slide and invite you to join me for the second, and I'll finish it on the third slide. On this Easter morning, let us look again at the lives we have been so generously given, and let us let fall away the useless baggage that we carry, old cave, old habits, old ways of seeing and feeling, and let us have the courage to begin again. Life is very short, and we are no sooner here than it is time to depart again, and we should use it to the, the full time that we, that we still have. We don't, we don't realize all the good we can do. A kind, encouraging word or helping hand can bring many a person through dark valleys in their lives. We weren't put here to make money or to acquire status. We were sent here to search for the light of Easter in our hearts. And when we find it, we are meant to give it away generously. The dawn that is rising this Easter morning is a gift to our hearts, and we are meant to celebrate it and carry away from this holy, ancient place the gifts of our healing and light and the courage of a new beginning. Amen. Thank you to our choir. Nice to see a lot of kids here. If you're comfortable coming up, I'd love to have you join me at the front for a story. And I'm going to do this because I forgot to do this. I noticed uh, that song that the choir just sang is written by Don Bessick, who wrote the Go Now in Peace that we sing at the end of the service, which is kind of neat. Oh, I forgot something.
Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. All the questions will be answered imminently. <laughs> Has everybody had a good Easter so far? Yeah? You don't look like you've had a good Easter so far. Are you sure? Anybody have an Easter egg hunt this morning? No, but I had one last night. You had one last Yeah, we had a great Easter egg hunt last night for those that came here. We might even find a few eggs scattered around the church here this morning. Anyway, Easter's a great day for lots of reasons. Uh, it's a fun day. It's a day for family. It's a day to come to church because you all came to church today. It's a day for faith. It's a day for lots of good things. Um, what is the most, probably the most well-known symbol of Easter? The cross. The cross is a symbol of Easter for sure. What's another symbol of Easter? Cain? Eggs. Attaboy. Eggs. <laughs> Why on earth would eggs be a symbol of Easter? When... You give an answer? Well, because it's fun, right? An egg hunt game is fun. But this is basically what happened. A long, 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 long time ago, in a place called Mesopotamia, which doesn't exist anymore, it's now called Iraq, there was a king. And said, as the story goes, one Easter Sunday, he was going to make his breakfast, and he cracked open an egg. And before he cooked the egg, he looked at it, and he thought, He thought, that looks a lot like the empty tomb in the Easter story that Jesus came out of. And that supposedly is where the story of the, of the eggs started, where eggs started becoming a symbol of Easter. And of course, they're one of the best symbols of Easter today. Now, they're not just a symbol for Easter in Canada, but in, for all over the world. So what I thought we'd do for a few minutes this morning is I would share a few different traditions of Easter eggs from around the world. Some of these are pretty interesting I think they are. I hope you do too. So if you want to take a look at the screen, I'm not going to eat the egg. That's tomorrow's breakfast. <laughs> so this comes from a country called Scotland. You ever heard of Scotland? Yeah. So Scotland, one of the traditions that they do, I don't know if they still do this, but on Easter Sunday, they would get eggs, they would boil the eggs, they would color the eggs. Then they go to a top of a hill and they'd roll the eggs down the hill. Whichever egg rolls the furthest uh, is, would be the winner. It's also meant to symbolize the rolling away of the stone away from the tomb. So that's something they do in Scotland. Now, does that look like a hill to you? <laughs> I don't think Scottish people know a hill from a field, but anyway, that's all right. <laughs> Hi, Deb. <laughs> okay, next one. This is kind of a funny picture, but this is actually a neat story. So a long time ago in Germany, this used to be an Easter tradition. What they would do on Easter Sunday morning is they would get out of bed and they would put eggs on the floor and they would do a dance. They would make up a dance, and the idea is you don't step on the eggs and break them. Sometimes they would actually do it blindfolded. So that was a tradition that came from Germany. Okay, next one. So this is actually from Greece. I love this. This is a game that, uh, that often kids would play at Easter. What you would do is you would get an egg, and it wouldn't be boiled. It would be raw. They would, they would paint it red. I'm not going to tell you why, but they would paint it red. And then basically what you would do is you would sit in a circle, almost like duck, duck, goose. You would hold your egg, and then you would go turn to the person beside you and tap the top of your egg on the top of their egg. The idea was that you didn't want your egg to break, but you wanted their egg to break. So you want to hit it hard enough that theirs breaks, but yours doesn't. The last person that has an egg that doesn't break is the winner. So that's what happens in Greece. Next one. This is, I love this, this is Mexico. So in Mexico, uh, Easter's a really big deal. It's a really big deal in lots of places, but it's a really, really big deal in Mexico. They go all out with feasts and festivals and get-togethers and church services. Here's one of their very unique customs. They get eggshells like this, and they get the yolk out, and then they put confetti in the egg. And what they do is after they've had Easter dinner, they get out these eggs, and then they go around and they crack them open over everybody's head. The confetti comes down, and it's supposedly a sign of good luck. So I thought it would be really cool if we could do that here, but we're not allowed to have confetti in the church because it makes a mess. So, so we couldn't do that. But it's also based on another really strange tradition going back to Spain. And what, the, what they used to do is sometimes Easter was considered a great time if you kind of like somebody, maybe you want to ask them out on a date. It was a good time to do that. So what they would do is they would take eggs, they would fill them with perfume, and then the men would go around and throw them at the, the girls or the women that they want to try and have a date with. 
Absolutely true. I wouldn't suggest doing that. I think a nice text probably today would be a better thing than throwing eggs at people. But that's where that came from as well. Okay. Anybody know what country these eggs are from? What do you think? I, <laughs> pretty close. Um, the Ukraine, and maybe in parts of Russia as well. Um, I don't know if we have anybody from the Ukraine here, so if you do, please tell me if I pronounced this wrong. I think it's pronounced Paisanki. Who said? Oh, figures Daniel knows. <laughs> Daniel knows everything. I'm kidding. <laughs> Pazanka. Okay, thank you, Daniel. So, Pazanka. And it's a, a, a method of decorating eggs. Aren't they really beautiful? Could you imagine the time and tension it would go into creating eggs like that? You would create those eggs, you would give them to your family as a sign of, of, of love, as a sign of health, and as a sign of peace. There's a great old legend about why they started this. Um, as the legend goes, that when Jesus was making his way to the cross, he had to carry the cross on his back, and it was very heavy. And as the story goes, there was a guy called Simon the Peddler, and Simon was carrying a basket of eggs, like real eggs, and uh, Peddler's like a sales, uh, salesperson, and he saw Jesus carrying the cross. It was really heavy, and as the story goes, he put down his basket, helped Jesus carry the cross, and then when he went back to his basket, they had turned into these beautiful colored, of egg, uh, beautiful colored eggs. So that's the legend there. So it's cool that all over the world, eggs are a symbol, and they're a symbol of what this day is all about. I want to show you one more because this is interesting. Do you know what that is? It's the most expensive egg in the world. It's a Fabergé egg. Do you know how much that is worth? One million dollars? Not even close. <laughs> 8.6 million dollars. So it actually has chocolate somewhere in the inside of it, but then there's a layer of, uh, of, of gold around the outside, the shell, and then it's all kinds of diamonds that are put on the outside of it. And if you want to buy your mom or your dad a nice Easter gift, 8.6 million, <laughs> it's pretty much a bargain. <laughs> but to come full circle, everybody, the point of this story is what this day is all about. It's about the story that we read in the Bible of Jesus rising again. And we think about that old king back there in Mesopotamia opening his egg and seeing it was empty. And get, was that, that was his symbol. So what I want to do is give each of you just an empty egg today. There's lots of candy in the back. You can maybe fill them yourselves. But I want you to give you an egg today just to remind you of what this day is really all about. Jack, could you pass those out for me? Thank you. They're all the same size. <laughs> but, but way to capture the spirit of Easter, uh, Jack. <laughs> okay, guys, well, have a great, whatever you're doing the rest of today. Anybody have any special plans? Anybody going anywhere? Kane, what are you doing? I'm having a sleepover at Nice, sleepover. Grandmothers, anybody else doing anything special today? What are you guys doing? Going to your aunt's house? Well, whatever you do, have a great day and happy Easter, everybody. And you can follow Lori right out that way. Hey, Phil. Yep. Make sure that you don't ask those squatters that egg on I'll be, I'll be careful. I'll be, I'll be careful. Let us now continue to worship God as we present and dedicate our morning offering. <laughs>
joy, it's a day of hope, it's a day of peace. We know all those qualities come to life when we take a moment to reach out and help someone else. May you bless these gifts today, bless our Easter celebrations and all that is ahead. Amen. Before I share the message today, I'd like to share a reading from uh, the Bible, and uh, this is the story of Easter as told from the Gospel according to John. John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed. She began to weep. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away the body of my Lord, and I do not know where they have taken him. Then she left the tomb. A short distance away, she saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know that it was Jesus. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have placed him, and I will take him away. Jesus put his hand on her shoulder and said, Mary. She turned around and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbi. Jesus then said to her, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them what you have seen. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Amen. And let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our light. For a few weeks over this winter, our study group has been looking at a book called Rescuing God from Religion. The author of the book is a guy called Robin Myers, and he's a minister in a big church in Oklahoma. He wrote many profound things about life and faith in that book, but he also shared some of his own experiences of being in a church for 30 years, ministering to the same people. And you think I've been here too long. <laughs> and he made this bold statement. He said... I dread Easter Sunday because the Easter Sunday sermon is the most difficult sermon of the year to preach. Now on the surface, that sounds absurd because Easter Sunday is the biggest day in the Christian calendar. It is way bigger than Christmas, at least in terms of its significance. A minister saying that he dreads Easter just doesn't make sense. It will be like a pilot being afraid of heights or a florist suffering from hay fever a banker who counts on ten of her fingers. It will be like a teacher saying, I have the best job in the world until the kids arrive. <laughs> we have a lot of teachers here, and you really say that, don't you? <laughs> a minister saying he dreads an Easter Sunday sermon is crazy. This is our Academy Award-winning moment. This is the peak of the Mount of Everest. To a minister, this is the equivalent of beating the Boston Bruins in Game 7 of the Stanley Cup playoffs. <laughs> it's Easter. This is our time to shine. It's our most important message. So why on earth would this minister say that Easter Sunday is the hardest day to preach on? Well, I'll tell you why he said it in a second, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this first. I'm glad he did, because I couldn't agree more. And when I read that, I felt like shouting, Hallelujah, I'm not alone. And it might not be for the reason that you think. It's not because it's difficult to say something new about the same story year in and year out. That's not it. The reason is this, and it was his reason as well. Because I know that whatever I say in the next 15 minutes, I can't make everyone here happy. Not that I can any other week, but I pretend that I can other weeks. <laughs> because Easter is seen by people in so many different ways. And when people come to church on an Easter Sunday, 
They're not looking to have their faith challenged. They want to have their faith affirmed. The same when they come on Christmas Day. They want to hear a story spoken about the way that they've come to understand it. Unlike that other minister, I haven't spent 30 years in the same congregation. But believe it or not, this is my 17th year at Northwest. And in that time, I've had dozens, maybe hundreds of conversations with people about their faith and about the things they believe. And I've come to the conclusion that when it comes to our faith here, we are an eclectic bunch. So when it comes to the Easter story or understanding it, we are an eclectic bunch. We're not on the same page. Hence, we're not necessarily looking for the same message. There are those here today whose faith is absolutely grounded in the belief that Jesus bodily rose from the dead on that first Easter Sunday. To believe anything but is short of heresy. It is to question whether you are a Christian because that's what the crux of the Christian faith is for them. It's the belief in the physical resurrection of Jesus. Easter is a line in the sand that they will not cross. I also know there are people here today who are thinking, I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad I'm here. I love Easter Sunday. As for the story, I don't buy it. As great a guy as Jesus was, bodies don't come back to life after they breathe their life. I'm happy to celebrate the life of this great man, but I can't go along with the traditional message. I'm happy to talk about resurrection as in bulbs coming out of the ground, but people coming out of the ground, I can't do it. Easter is a line in the sand. And those two people this morning could be sitting side by side in the same pew. And then there are most of the rest of us who might be somewhere along that uh, line between those sides. Those who are here who say, well, it seems unlikely to me, but miracles happen. God is God. Why couldn't it have happened? Others are saying, I have no doubt that Jesus rose from the dead. Well, sometimes maybe I kind of wonder a little. We disagree, and that's okay, because that's what we pride ourselves on here at Northwest. Freedom of thought. I also know this. There are some listening right now who might be thinking, it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what you think. All that matters is what this thinks, what this says, the Bible. This is our authority. Fair enough. But even the Bible doesn't agree on the details of Easter. The resurrection of Jesus is present in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The circumstances are different in each one of them. In Matthew, it is the two Marys who go to the tomb, and while they're there, there's an earthquake, and they watch an angel come from heaven and roll away the stone. In the Gospel of Mark, it's two Marys and Salome who go to the tomb. This time, the stone has already been rolled away, and inside, there's a man dressed in white telling them that Jesus is risen. In the Gospel of Luke, it says there are many women who came to the tomb. The stone is all rolled away, and inside there are two men in dazzling clothes, telling them Jesus has risen. And then in the Gospel of John, which I read, it is Mary Magdalene. She came alone. The stone was rolled away, and there were two angels inside. All four Gospels disagree on the details of the resurrection. Was it one person? Was it two? Was it many? Was the stone rolled away in their presence or before they arrived? Were there one angel, two angels, or no angels? It's not a consistent story. But that's okay, because rarely are eyewitness accounts of anything consistent between those who see it. If I asked you next week to tell me what colored tie I was wearing on Easter Sunday, some of you would say green, some would say blue, some would say yellow, and some would say, I don't think he was wearing a tie on Easter Sunday. <laughs> We're not always good eyewitnesses at anything. The stories disagree. By the way, do you know what those accounts do have in common? There's no men. There's no men. Where were the men? Good question. That's not an Easter sermon I'm about to preach anytime soon. <laughs> I actually did think one year of titling my Easter sermon, Where Are the Men? But uh, the kids were young. I needed to keep my job, so uh, I didn't do that. <laughs> they do come later. In fact, it actually makes me laugh because in one part in the story, one of the accounts, it says that Mary returned to the disciples, told them Jesus was risen. They didn't believe her. So Peter ran to the tomb, looked inside. Sure enough, the tomb was empty. And then he told Mary that Jesus was alive. I can just imagine Mary rolling her eyes. <laughs> well, now the men have decided he's risen. Obviously, he's risen. 
You know, if she lived in modern times, she might have turned to Peter and said, thanks for mansplaining the resurrection to me. <laughs> See, my point, Easter is difficult to preach about because historical accounts don't agree on what happened. None of us today can agree on what happened. Even the Bible doesn't agree on exactly what happened. And here's me in my brand new Easter tie. It's pink, by the way. <laughs> Standing in the middle of it all, trying to unpack it and hopefully send everybody away today with some kind of a message that is meaningful. It's a monumental task. And maybe that's why they say the effectiveness of an Easter sermon is not based on how many people are there on Easter Sunday, how many people come back the next week. So please come back. <laughs> Here is what I want to say this morning. I'm not going to preach about what we don't know. Let me preach about what we do know. I don't know exactly what happened that first Easter Sunday. I wasn't there. But I do know this. Something so amazing, so incredible, so monumental happened that day and in the days that followed. It started a ball rolling through history that to this day has not stopped. Something happened in the days following Jesus' death that proved to be a game changer. Throughout history, men and women have risen up with a message to share, some claiming to have prophetic powers, some claiming to be inspired by God, some claiming simply to have been born with a message that needed to be shared, and they've gathered great crowds of people to them. They've been given titles. They have had honors bestowed upon them. Some have been called old souls, great prophets, inspired teachers, sons or daughters of God, but then they've died. And what happened to the movement when they died? It died with them, or at least it was diminished. People tend to move on, find something else or someone else to follow. Even in Jesus' day, we have this notion that he was the only game in town, that he was the only wandering prophet, the only itinerant preacher, the only visionary purporting to have the keys to a new kingdom. But that's far from the truth. For centuries in the Jewish faith, a Messiah had been promised somebody who was going to lead them to the promised land, lead them to a new life, and there were no end of people who claimed to be that person. Jesus was one of many. Can we name any of them? Not a single one. Because when they died, their movement died, and people moved on. History is chock full of great men and women who've held the promise of something greater than this world can contain, who've claimed to know the will of God and the destiny of humanity, Contemporaries who have held him up as the one only to have history discard them when they are done. But that didn't happen with Jesus. Something happened in that graveyard or in the days following that lit a fire under his followers that history has never been able to douse. He was dead and yet he still lived. He breathed his last and yet his breath was still felt. He said on the cross, it is finished and yet he was actually only getting started. What happened? What happened in that graveyard? What happened in that upper room? What happened in the hearts of those dispirited, disassociated disciples that they then became laser-focused on making sure that Jesus was never forgotten? I don't know what happened in that cemetery, but I do know this. There was a resurrection. Was it bodily? Was it spiritual? I don't know. But Jesus somehow and in some form outlived his death and by doing so, started a ball rolling that nothing has stopped, been able to stop it. Do you know how incredibly significant that is? Remember the old hymn, Because He Lived. Because He Lived, we can face tomorrow, is the opening verse. We can expand that and say, because He lived, everything in the world changed. Because He lived, history pivoted. Because He lived, an entire world paused in its tracks held its breath and said, there's a new way to do this thing called life. Because he lived, we have the world that we have today. Because he lived, we have hospitals today. It's true. What is the symbol for a hospital? It's a cross. That is no coincidence. Look it up. Because he lived, we have food banks today. Because Jesus said, feed and take care of the poor. Because he lived, we educate our children rather than use them for common labor. Because Jesus saw children as having unique value. Because he lived, we have some of the most beautiful music and literature ever created. Because he lived, we have orphanages and hospices where our most fragile people can be cared for because Jesus saw human worth. Because he lived, 
Human beings have been able to rise above their most basic instincts and use their skills to the betterment of society because Jesus said, let your light shine. Because he lived, we have a justice system based at least in principle on fairness and integrity. Because he lived, because he lived, because he lived, I could go on and on. Everything in the world changed because he lived. You can't tell me that is coincidence. You can't tell me the entire world transformed itself based on an ordinary teacher who lived and died in Palestine 2,000 years ago. There was something that happened after Jesus' death that made his life the most sought after, written about, and followed life that ever lived. What happened in that graveyard? Did Jesus' body come back to life and breathe again? I don't know. Did angels in white come down from heaven and push away the stone? I don't know, but I do know this. Most definitely, Jesus rose. Most definitely, the essence of who that man was, the godliness within him and around him, came back to life and took the world by storm. Was that a physical resurrection? I don't know, and frankly, I don't care. My faith is not based on that fact. What my faith is based on is the power of his name according to his example and inspired by his spirit. We can keep rising because he keeps rising. And that's the good news of Easter, folks. When someone opens a Bible and finds a passage that convinces them, on, on courage that convinces them to turn away from an addiction, he rises again. When someone says a prayer and, and deepens themselves into the love and presence of God, he, lives, he rises again. When someone goes to church lonely and afraid, who may that very morning have thought about taking their own life, and instead they find community and connection, he rises again. When someone who is gay or lesbian or bisexual or trans discovers that through Jesus God loves them as fully and completely as anyone else, he rises again. When someone reads of Jesus' dedication to the poor and decides to help at a food bank or a shelter, to volunteer at hospice, he rises again. When someone reads one of his stories of grace or love, his stories of justice, his stories of peace, and they find the hope to make the next step along the road of life, he rises again. Is Jesus the resurrected one? You better believe it, folks, because he keeps showing up. And I'm going to take it one step further. I feel like a Baptist preacher this morning. <laughs> Can I have an amen? <laughs> oh, I'm just getting started. Let me say this. Thank goodness he still rises again because the world needs more Jesus. The world needs more Jesus. And I don't mean the Jesus that's rising out of the American evangelical movement like some kind of deformed and twisted evil menace. That's not the Jesus the world needs more of. Not the gun-toting, racist-spewing, homophobic, money-grabbing, obsessive, greedy, fear-mongering, intolerant Jesus. That's exactly not what the world needs. The world needs this Jesus, the Jesus that's found in the gospel, the Jesus who said, blessed are the peacemakers, the Jesus who said, become more like children, the Jesus who said, what you do for the least of my people, you do for me, the Jesus who said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will find comfort, the Jesus who said, nobody else sees you, but I see you, the Jesus who gave without counting the cost forgave without being asked to love with everything he had. The Jesus said, you want to find God? Look at the flowers. Look at the birds of the air. The Jesus who broke a law in order to heal a body. The Jesus who said, I don't care if you've got 99 sheep. If you've lost one, you go and search and you find that sheep. The Jesus who praised the kindly foreigner above the well-connected insider. The Jesus who stored worthiness and elevated human dignity. The Jesus who sacrificed it all to show the depth, breadth, and all-consuming nature of God's love. The world needs more Jesus. The battlefields of the Ukraine need more Jesus. The alleyways of Gaza need more Jesus. Our intensive care units, our classrooms, our courtrooms, our homes, our communities need more Jesus. People passionately driven to create a better world, passionately driven to restore what is broken, heal what is wounded, passionately driven to pursue peace at all costs and elevate love beyond all expectations, people passionately driven to see with new eyes and respond with renewed hearts, 
people who won't cross over to the other side of the road when the going gets tough, who won't withdraw when the heat is on, who won't back down when authority abuses or coerces people, people who understand that strength is found in gentleness, courage is found in commitment, love is loyalty, and faith beats fear every time. Faith beats fear every time. People of integrity, strength, courage to do what is right to expand the circle of love and say to someone, you've been on the outside for too long, you come inside, you are welcome, you are wanted, you are loved. And don't get me wrong, folks, when I say the world needs more Jesus, I'm not saying that the world needs more religion about Jesus, that the world needs more dogma or it needs more doctrine. It's exactly the opposite. Jesus was Jewish, that was his religion. We are Christian, that is our religion. But faith is so much, something so much bigger than the way that religion labels us. Faith is embracing the world with curiosity and openness and understanding. Faith will not ask you to be less so that I can be more. Faith will never diminish another person's path up the mountain of truth, but will see that path as having legitimate value. Faith does not see you as Christian or Muslim or Jewish before it sees you as a human being. Religion wants you to believe. Faith invites you to act. Religion would tell you who God is. Faith says, go out and find out for yourself. Religion will tell you how to get to heaven. Faith will remind you that in so many ways, heaven is already here. Faith will call you a sinner. Religion will call you a sinner. Faith will call you a miracle. Religion says, let us pray. Faith says, go and be a prayer. Religion is about believing in Jesus. But faith, my friends, is about being Jesus. As dawn rose on Easter Sunday, Mary Magdalene arrived at the garden. It was early, because it had to be early, because the keeper of the cemetery would arrive and chase away those who'd gathered, fearing grave robbers who were all too common. Mary was there because it felt right to be there. Jesus had been her everything, and now he was gone. She couldn't shake from her head the images of this broken body hanging limply from the cross. He seemed so strong and invincible. She never imagined in the end that he would be like everyone else, so fragile. She'd spent Saturday in her room, awash in tears, shocked, traumatized, overwhelmed with the realization that he was gone. Sleep that night had come sparingly. She'd been restless, her mind holding her captive and pushing away the soothing rhythm of sleep that wanted to whisk her away. And so she got up. She felt an impulse deep within her urging her to go to the place where his body was, as if a voice inside said, you need to be where he is. And so she went. His tomb was not hard to find. Footprints in the mud led right up to it. Still there from Friday when Joseph had carried his body to the tomb, where a couple of compassionate soldiers had helped to roll the stone in place. At first she wondered if her mind was playing tricks on her. The stone had been moved. She was sure of it. Or was she seeing things? As she moved closer, her suspicions were confirmed. The stone was moved out of place. It was pushed to the side. She put her hand on it to try to move it, wondering if it had rolled on its own, but it was solid. She didn't want to look in for fear that what she may find, she knew what grave robbers often did to bodies that they disturbed. And surely this was the work of grave robbers. But she knew that Jesus was not buried with treasures, so their efforts would have been thwarted. Cautiously she peered in, and she gasped. The tomb was empty. She was frightened, angry, confused of all the great indignities. Why would they have taken his body? What would it profit anybody to steal a body? Rushing from the grave, she almost ran right into a solitary figure standing on the edge of the garden. Mistaking him for the gardener, she asked him, What have you done to my Lord? Where have you taken him? The stranger did not speak. Simply placed a hand on her shoulder. Mary, he said, in a voice she knew only too well. The voice that had inspired hundreds laughed heartily whispered words of comfort, soothed fears, and opened hearts. That voice, his voice, his soothing, gentle, comforting, rhythmic voice. She looked into his eyes, Jesus, is that really you? Friends, let me end with this. 
Easter can mean whatever you want it to mean. Believe what you wish about that first Easter. Celebrate it as you see fit. But please learn from what happened to Mary in the, great, in the garden and know this. He lives. In whatever way you want to understand that, he lives. And the best place to find him is in the voice and face of love. So come. Come, you peacemakers. Come, you gentle souls. Come, you wounded healers. Come, you curious seekers. Come, you open-hearted caregivers. Come, you inspired truth-tellers. Come, you adventurers and wanderers. Come, you givers and lovers. Come, you motivators and encouragers. Come, you loyal friends, you helpful, humble helpers. Come, you faithful, and join in the movement again, the movement that started in a graveyard long ago, that history has never swept away, a movement of justice, a movement of peace, a movement of grace, a movement to create nothing short than a kingdom of God's love. Amen. Will you come back next week? (laughs) Let us pray. God of the resurrection, as we celebrate this day of new life, we celebrate all the ways you continue to be a surprising presence in our lives and in the world. Even though it is still March, we see signs of your new world emerging. Birdsong, buds, longer nights all hint at the beauty that is to come. On this Easter Sunday, we give thanks. We give thanks for all the places that we find beauty and peace in this gathered community of worship, in friends and loved ones who walk with us on our journey, in peaceful and prayerful moments when you feel your comforting and certain presence. In so many places, our hallelujahs ring out because we are immersed in the gifts of new life and the gifts of Easter. May we carry that spirit with us as we leave here today. May we carry it forward in the love and care we give to those in need. May we carry it forward as courage to face the uncertainty of tomorrow. May we carry it forward as hope that in all things and in all places we are never separated from your spirit. May we carry it forward as joy, letting laughter and light fill the darkened corners. May we carry it forward as faith as we entrust each step of our journey to you. And may this spirit of resurrection and new life create ripples across the world. May those who walk in darkness see the light of transformed living. May those who suffer alone know they are not alone. May those who traffic in power and coercion know peace. May those who feel lost find their way home. God, the promise of this day is a light that cannot be dimmed. Faithfully, enthusiastically, and with great integrity, may we bear this light in the world, living as Easter people. And now we ask ourselves what we are praying for today and who we're praying for today. Our Easter prayers for hope, for healing, for forgiveness, for compassion, they are many. And so in the silence now of our own hearts, we offer our own prayers to you. May you fill them with promise and with presence. God, hear our prayers. We are an Easter people. Hallelujah is our song. Let us go now and sing it. Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. And hear us now as we continue to pray with the words of the Lord's Prayer.
from home, please enjoy the rest of your Easter Sunday. Our closing hymn is Sing Your Joy. Let us stand and sing our joy. is possible. Empower us when anxiety and amazement seize our spirits. Open our hearts to our neighbors yearning for rebirth. Go and celebrate this wonder-filled season of new life. Amen.